morning, everyone, and welcome to Grace Point. If you can stand with us, we're going to begin worship. We're going to sing Let Our Faith Become a Mountain.
churchy words that we say. Uh, it's really a simple word, and we break it down like this. Hallelujah means praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But it goes a little bit further when you break it down into the, the ancient Hebrew. It actually means to lift up a song of praise. Lift up a song of praise. So what this song is saying is, listen, when you're in the middle of a fight, when you're in the middle of a battle that you can't win on your own strength, that you can't, you can't get your way through it, you can't figure your way through it, you can't pay your way through it, you can't get through it on your own. What it says is, I'm going to lift a hallelujah. I'm going to lift a song of praise because my victory is found in my Savior. My victory is found in the one that died for me. So we are going to raise a hallelujah this morning. And listen, it doesn't matter what you're facing. It's a financial issue. If it's a physical issue, if it's an emotional issue, raise that hallelujah and understand. Glory to God. Understand that your victory is just on the other side. Concepts and, and, and imagery and all of that, and, and that's great. But I was just sitting here thinking, you, you got you to gotta shout till the walls come down, okay? Shout till the walls come down. What does that mean? Joshua chapter 6, you know this, the children of Israel, they're walking around the, the city of Jericho. They had to get inside there. The thing that was promised them was inside there. It was on the other side of those walls. So what I'm saying to you this morning is that victory that's been promised, that hope that's been given, it's on the other side of those walls, and we're going to shout till the walls come down. Play it. Come on, let's sing it. Raise a hallelujah. Come on.
choice here this morning. You can sit soak and sour. Or you can stand up and worship the King of Kings. Let me tell you what's going to happen if you sit soak and sour. You're going to leave here with the same problem that you walked in with. That's what's going to happen. You're going to still be angry. You're going to still be depressed. You're still going to be bitter. You're still going to be face, uh, facing that medical issue. But when you raise a hallelujah, you invoke the power of the king. Oh, come on, somebody. You invoke the power of our savior. You invoke the power of our healer. You invoke the power of the one that, that comes to restore and to heal and, and to put back together what the enemy has tried to destroy. So I don't know about you today, but there are parts of my life I need, I need to touch you. I need the master of the storm to come riding into, into my situation. one more time. I'm going to sing it through just once more. If you've got a problem, meet your solution right here in this altar. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about what your girlfriend might say or your husband or your wife. Come meet your Savior down here.
Psalm 145. Jump down to verse 3, Steve. It says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Verse 4. This is what's going on right here, right now. One generation shall praise your name, or praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. We got, oh, come on. We got kids down here worshiping. We got uh, young adults. We got adults. We got, we got seasoned adults down here worshiping. Declaring his mighty acts. Has God done something for you today? Has God done something this week, this month, this year? Come on. Church, the day is too late for us to get quiet and forget who we are. We are sons and daughters of the King. We have been bought at a high price. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not ashamed of who I am. I'm not ashamed of whose I am. And I'm not ashamed of who's in me. We are a Pentecostal church. Glory to God. Glory to God. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We worship you this morning. We praise your holy name this morning. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Lord, we honor you today. Lord, I know that when the battle comes, I may have to face it, but I don't have to fight it because you'll fight it for me. Lord, I know that when the enemy comes in, your word says that you will raise up a standard against him. Lord, I know that when the battle is coming, your word said that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Lord, I know if I trust in you, if I follow you, your word said that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God. Lord, I'm following you today. I'm trusting you today. I'm walking in your path today. Lord, I'm walking where you tell me to walk today. Lord, I pray that you will just continue to pour your spirit out in this service. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Uh, let's just keep singing. Go to the next song. We got announcements and offering and all that. We'll get to that later. Is that okay? Can we just worship? Let's go to song number four, whichever one that is. Come on. Let's worship today, church.
your holy name today. Amen, amen, amen.
eyes outstanding. Amen. It is well with my soul. You know, we could call it a day right now and say we have been in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Unfortunately, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Steve, let's go and show the announcement video real quick. While they're doing that, if the ushers will go ahead and come forward. Nope. Sorry. We can have children. Yeah. Yeah, they'll be short. Sure. Hey ladies, this Thursday, May 23rd, is King's Daughters. Bonnie Hammond is leading the devotion. Make sure to be there. Fellows, join us June 6th at 6.30 for Men's Fellowship. Dave Cato will be the speaker. And bring us back to life. Both of these events will be at the Fellowship Hall. Celebration Sundays, June 30th. There will be baby dedications, water baptisms, and new church memberships. This will be a great opportunity to get involved and to get plugged in to Grace Point. See Miranda Eisenberg for more information. The Sunday before is June 23rd. Immediately after service will be a new members class. This will be a class for all those that are interested in joining on the 30th. service, you may want to ask Josh how he got that gash in the back of his head. I'm just saying. You may want to talk to him about that. Um, remember June 30th. That's a big Sunday. If you are interested in joining the church or having a baby dedicated or being baptized in water, uh, Miranda, everybody see Miranda? She's got a, a little information packet we need you to fill out so if you can do that for her <laughs> mm, excuse me but I was fighting that one for about 10 minutes anyway um, see her and we'll get you all signed up for that we're looking forward to that also uh, King's Daughters this week and Men's Fellowship um, June 6th um, if you will, get your tithes and your offerings together, and immediately after the tithe and offering, we'll dismiss the kids for children's church. If you'll take your tithe and your offering and hold it in your hand. Dear Heavenly Father, you have blessed us beyond measure already today. Lord, you have touched our hearts, you've touched our bodies, you've touched our spirits and our minds. And Lord, we, we take one more opportunity to worship you worship you with our giving, our tithe, and our offering. Lord, I pray that you will receive this tithe and this offering and that you will bless it and you will break it and you will multiply it. You'll meet the needs of this church and allow this church to meet the needs of this community. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Y'all okay if I preach without a jacket this morning? I worded up a little, a little warmth a while ago. I got a little ring up here, guys. All right. Let's go ahead and dismiss our kids for Children's Church. There we go.
Now here's the good news. I've only got a two hour sermon this morning. Amen. No, I promise you I won't keep it at two hours. More like an hour 45. Anyway, uh, most of you guys know that I worked at the Church of God Publishing House for about eight and a half years. And um, the first two or three years of that time, I had this, this um, office that was kind of in the middle of a bunch of other offices, and I didn't have any windows. I couldn't see outside. I didn't know if it was raining or snowing or the sun was shining, if it was hot, if it was cold. My office stayed hot because the air conditioning didn't work in there. But anyway, uh, I had that office. And then I got promoted, and they moved me to the basement. <laughs> and, and I had a really great office, big office, had lots of air conditioning, but no windows still. I, I could have eight or ten people in there. It was a great office, but I still didn't know what was going on in the world around me. I, I figured I was about one more promotion away from being under the publishing house, which is kind of scary. But then a great day came, and, and, and I got uh, promoted again, and I moved back upstairs onto this office on the front side of the building, and I didn't have one window I had two. Come on. And I was so excited about that. I, I was so excited to be able to look out that window. And, and um, if you looked off to the side, you could see North Cleveland Church of God. And if you looked straight out the window, you could see Lee University kind of spread out uh, that way. And, and, and I could sit there and see... Um, I saw squirrels and chipmunks and, and other things scurrying around uh, in front of the publishing house. And I could watch it snow or rain or, or, or whatever. And I could see who was pulling up. It was a great thing. I had vision. But those first five years, man, I didn't feel like I was really in touch with what was going on around me. I didn't feel like I had knowledge. I didn't have any kind of revelation. I didn't know. I didn't know what the rest of the world knew. And this happens when you begin to lose touch with the reality of the world around you. There's, there's no connection with any other life except for, for that that's within your own little comfort area, your own little comfortable space. That's all you know. And then, like I said, I got promoted. I could look out that window, and, and it seemed like the world around me had been revealed. It's a good thing. I'm going to read to you a few scriptures this morning. Stand with me, if you will, please. Five scriptures. We'll be quick. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say there's still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord, I pray that you will just anoint these next few minutes. Let me say what I believe you've laid on my heart. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Anybody hungry this morning? Come on, if you're hungry, right? Yeah, Chance. Chance is my, my, my buddy. Every time he sees me, he tells me I'm his best friend. I know 
if there's anybody in the world that will be hungry with me, it's chance. Okay? I'm hungry. I'm always hungry. I, I stay in a permanent state of hunger. Um, we, we have a rule at our house that nobody eats alone. So whatever time you show up at our house, if you're hungry, I'm going to sit down and eat with you. That's just one of the things that we do. Lord's fed us today. Amen. Amen. But there is a harvest outside the walls of this church that has not experienced what we've experienced this morning. Proverbs 29, 18, you guys, I'm sure know this verse really, really well. It says, without revelation, people run wild, but one who listens to instructions will be happy. Now, the King James version of this, probably the, the one you memorize, same one I memorize, it said, uh, that's not the right verse. 29, not 18, not chapter 19. <laughs> Anyway, the King James Version says where there is no vision, the people perish, right? Now, the, the word translated as vision is where we get knowledge or revelation. The word translated perish comes with the without restraint. So what the writer is saying, listen, if you don't understand what God's doing, if you don't get a revelation of what God's doing, if you don't understand uh, God and the, the ways that he does things, then your worldview is going to be off. You, you, you got something critically missing in your life, in your walk, and in church. So what's our view of the world around us? What, do, do we even have a, a worldview? Do we even have a view of our community? Do we have a sense of what we need in our community? Or are we at that place in our church life where we've just gotten so comfortable already with where we are? Next week will be exactly one year that I've been your pastor. Thank you. <laughs> I'll pay you for that later. God has done a lot of great stuff in that year. A lot of great stuff. Stuff that's been, been public and, and we've been able to see it. And then some stuff that, that's individual and private and, and personal to so many of our, our, our members. But church, the, 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 the problem that we face, that a lot of churches face is, we can reach a certain point and get comfortable. Hey, God's done this. We've grown. God's good. I'm going to sit back. <laughs> Nobody here would do that, right? Man, Lord, we've had a great year. I can't believe it's a year. I've still got a few boxes in the garage I have not unboxed. I think that means I probably don't need whatever's in those boxes. You know why those boxes are still there in the garage and haven't been unboxed? We got comfortable with what we had. I didn't need to do anything else. I didn't need to feel like I had to, 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 to try to do anything else. I didn't have to, to go uh, work at anything else. I'm comfortable. I, I, I lay awake at night. I don't, I don't, Andre will tell you, I don't sleep a whole lot. I, I, my brain starts running away with me. And I, I start thinking, and, and so I started writing down some of the questions that, um, that were popping into my head this week. What's the view of Grace Point Community Church of God? Are we perched on this hill to just be here? What, what do we see? Is our vision clear? Do we look through spiritually focused glasses? Or are we myopic and inward looking? What is God's view? When God rests on this property and he looks out around us, what does he see? What does he see that we don't see? Well, what is his vision for the people around us? And then I get real personal with God. I'm like, God, where should I be looking? What should I be looking at? What should I be looking for? 
Where, where do you want me to turn my attention, my eyes? See, I'm, <laughs> I'm not God. I, I'm not omniscient. I'm not omnipresent. I don't, I don't see everything and hear everything and know everything. I, I see what I look at. Right? So God, what do you want me looking at? Uh, one of my favorite baseball players is a guy named Yogi Berra. Y'all know I love baseball. It's one of God's great gifts, that and sweet tea. <laughs> Yogi Berra, he's, he was a brilliant guy, and he was asked how, how come he understood so much about baseball, and he said, well, listen, you can observe a lot just by watching. Okay, I'll have to explain that later. You can see a lot if you look. But we get a problem with we don't want to look anymore. For years, uh, they would run these commercials on TV about all these kids in Africa that are starving. And they'd show this one picture every single time. This one video of a, of a kid sitting there looking so sick and a bug crawling across its face. How many have seen that commercial? When you see that commercial stop start now, how many of you either fast forward through it, turn the channel, leave the room? You don't want to see it, right? We don't want to know that that's going on. Can I tell you there are things going on in our community right now that we don't see and we don't know, not because that they're hidden, but because we quit looking at it. We quit looking at the needs of our community. We quit looking at the people that are hurting most around us. We quit looking at them with spiritual eyes saying, God, how can I help? Helen Keller said, or was asked once, what would be worse than being born blind? And she said, having sight but no vision. So what's your view of the world? Now, the, the vision that I'm talking about goes beyond uh, natural sight, the kind of sight we have with our physical eyes. It goes to our heart. It goes, goes to, to our soul. Not what we can physically see, but what we should be looking at and seeing spiritually. So we come to our text this morning. I just read you. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And this is right after he's had the encounter with the, the lady at the well. And the, the disciples are all excited. And, and he's telling them all this stuff. And then he, he, he's talking to them about something that they should understand. He, he, he's not talking about necessarily grain. But he wraps it up in this agricultural analogy for them now the truth of it is folks we should understand an agricultural reference right there's a lot of farm land around here i was telling daryl yesterday um in, in georgia depending upon how long you've been in georgia if you've been there a couple three generations there's this true uh true statement this uh, thing that's pretty much true of all the generations that are there and that we're all one generation removed from the cotton field. My great, great, great grandfather migrated to Georgia from North Carolina. We were farmers. As a matter of fact, my family history, you're either a farmer, a preacher, or a moonshiner. Sometimes you were all three. <laughs> Whatever it takes to pay the bills. My great-grandfather, my, my grandfather's dad, Henry David, was a sharecropper, which means he farmed somebody else's land for just a little bit of food and, a, and the right to live in this shack of a house. Outdoor plumbing, kerosene lamps, uh, coal stove. My uh, grandfather left home uh, after he graduated sixth grade, but he enjoyed third grade so much he went through it twice. 
But he graduated sixth grade. He left home, worked his way around, and winds up in the military. And uh, he started sending back half of his paycheck every two weeks to the, the family to help support my grandfather and or my great grandfather and grandmother and all of his brothers and sisters and they wound up buying land first time a spivey had owned land it's a big deal and we farmed it they farmed it potatoes and onions and uh corn and and you know mustard greens y'all have mustard greens and collard greens up here man those things are good a little, a little hot sauce on them makes life good So I understand farming. I'd go back to the, the farm. We, we raised a little tobacco. We, we did whatever. <clears throat> and let me tell you, working a farm will make a man out of you. You get up early. You stay out there late. It's hot. Those, <laughs> those mules, when you're trying to plow, they don't like to cooperate. It's bad. So Jesus says here in verse 35, don't you say there are four more months till comes the harvest. Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields for they are ready for harvest. So it's about to be June. Four months will be September, be harvest time, September, October. And you, you can look at that and say, man, we got all kinds of time. We got plenty of time to get this stuff done. You know, harvest time is one of the busiest times on a farm. And it takes a ton of hard work to get to that place. Because if you slack off in the months leading up to harvest, your crops can burn up because you didn't water them. You can forget to fertilize them. You could uh, not plant them right. My uncle, um, my great uncle Philip, he... Uh, he was the prankster of the family. He and uh, one of his friends was told to go out to part of the, the field and plant some uh, mustard greens, and um, they didn't do it. So they had these two big 50-pound bags of mustard green or seeds, and they slung them all up underneath the house. So after you know, a couple, three weeks, when nothing was popping through the soil, Henry David surmised that that was just a couple bags of bad seed. It was a lost cause. But then something happened, and he had to crawl under the house. And he found the awfulest mess of greens growing under the house. There are things that can interrupt the harvest if you're not paying attention to it. So that's what happens. We got four months. One of the things that I'm convinced that the enemy does, one of the tactics of the enemy, is to tell us that we've got plenty of time. We got plenty of time. You know, we've been preaching that Jesus is coming back. The Church of God was founded in 1886. We've been preaching that message since 1886. You got plenty of time. Can I tell you, church, we have no promise of tomorrow. Let me take it a little bit further. We got no promise of lunch. That's how close the second coming is. So we stand here today and, man, we've worshiped great and God is wonderful and we've been fed. But if we're not careful, we'll focus on the meal and we'll miss our, uh, our mission. Our, our mission isn't just to come here every now and then and get our praise on. Our mission is to go out into the world around us and find those folks that are hurting, find those folks that are in need, find those folks that, that are desperate for Jesus Christ and tell them who he is. That's why we're here. That's the, that's the only reason a church exists. It's the only true reason why a church should exist. We're not a social club. We're not a, a, a concert hall. We're not some place where you can just come get your, your heart tickled a little bit and then go live your life. We're the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. 
We're supposed to go out into the world. The harvest is four months off, man. We don't have to worry about anything. Man, that pastor of ours, he's always pushing projects, projects, projects. He wants stuff done. He wants stuff done. He wants to get it done. You know why I want to get it done? We're running out of time. I push because people's lives are hanging in the balance. Oh, pastor, do you think they really care if there's a fresh coat of paint in children's church? Yes, I do. I really do. Oh, pastor, do you think it matters if we do this or that? Yeah, I really do. I think it matters. I think it matters because what it tells people is there's something going on at that place and I need to go check it out. It draws people in. It gives them a, a, a reason. It gives them something to say, you know, I feel like the Holy Spirit, and they won't know that word. They won't even understand how to categorize it. But I feel something pulling me into that place. So what I want you to do, it's already 12 o'clock. Here's what I want you to do. You may say, Pastor, I, I'm not ever going to go be a missionary. Andre and I were talking about this last night. I know confidently God has never called me to be a missionary in Africa. You know why? I'm allergic to elephants. It's a true story. Terribly allergic to elephants. Break out in whelps all over the place. Even up in my hair, it's terrible. I know God's not called me to be a missionary. God has not called me to be uh, some great musical uh, superstar to sing and and, and pronounce his praises all over the world. That's not my, my gig. So what's God called me to do? He's called me to pastor a church, called me to preach, called me to love. What's God called you to do? You have a calling in your life. You have skills and talents and abilities and things that are uniquely put into your life for the glory of God and the edification of the body. That's what the word says. So what's God called you to do? Well, I don't know, pastor, help me. Great, I'm glad you asked. How about this? This is perfect weather now. We're, we're all getting out, uh, walking around our neighborhoods. Who, who likes to take walks in the neighborhood? Come on. How about this? Next time you walk through your neighborhood, you pray for your neighbors. You, just, you don't have to go talk to them. For some of you, that would scare you to death. Lord, bless this house. Bless the folks that come into it. Bless those that leave from it. Bless them while they're having breakfast or dinner. Bless them while they're sleeping. Lord, awaken a spiritual hunger in them that they've never known existed. What about the, the service folks that come through your, your, your neighborhood? The, the guys that may cut grass in your neighborhood or... Um, the plumbers or the cable TV repair guy. What if you pray, Lord, everybody that visits where we live, touch them. And if I give the opportunity to interact with them, Lord, let me say something that'll be a blessing to them. Lord, bless the police and the, the first responders that drive through our community. Bless the school buses that drive through. Bless the kids that are on those buses. And Lord knows, bless the bus drivers. Can we do that? How hard is that? It's not. And then here's the other thing. Pastor, listen, I'm not ever going to get up on the platform and speak. Great. But you know what you can do? You probably hold the paintbrush. Can you cut down some weeds? Can you help plant some flowers? Can you do those things? Sure you can. Everybody can. Everybody has a part. So what are you talking about, Pastor? I'm saying in church that there's a harvest out there. People that need to meet Jesus Christ that are literally going to die and go to hell because we've gotten so comfortable 
with our church and where we are that we're missing the harvest. Now, I'm going to be super transparent with you right now. I fall into that same habit myself. Just two weeks ago, I'm, I, I like to work in schedules and I like to kind of plan things a quarter ahead and, and, and look if we're going to have a theme Sunday and, and what we're going to do. And, and I remember these words coming out of my mouth. Well, you know, the last week in May is uh, Memorial Sunday or Memorial Weekend. After that, we'll have our summer swoon. So we don't need to worry about anything till fall. I said those words. And immediately the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, you, you don't think people get saved in the summer? You don't think people can come to church and have their needs met in the summer? I'm like, well, Lord, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying that folks will go camping and they'll go on vacation and, and all that. He said, but I don't go anywhere. I'm not leaving. So what are you going to do? <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to play in the summer. We're going to do stuff. We're going to reach out to our community. I am convinced. I'm convinced that communities die for lack of a spiritual revival. I believe that. I believe that, that churches get complacent. They get comfortable. They get an us for no more mentality. That's a good South Georgia expression. But that's not going to be us. We're going to win the lost. We're going to work to meet the needs of this community. If somebody's hungry, we're going to feed them. If somebody needs clothes, we're going we're gonna to find them some clothes. If somebody needs a Bible, we're going to buy them a Bible. Well, Pastor, what, what might that cost? I don't know. But I do know this. My daddy owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I know this. Churches don't have financial problems. They have spiritual problems. And if we believe that we are who we say we are, God will meet the needs. God will provide. God will give us the, the, the resources, the tools, the energy, the opportunity. He'll provide that. But here's the thing, church, and I, man, I hope this isn't coming across like I'm beating you up. We can't sit on our pews and expect to win the lost. Do you hear me? We can't just come in here on Sunday morning and get a little praise on and go home and not care. We got to pray for the community. We got to walk through our streets and, and pray for people. We got to read the word. We got to get Christ inside of us and, and get it to that point that it literally affects what we see, who we see. Uh, Daryl and I, yesterday again, we were over drinking coffee at Martin's. And um, without going into a lot of the story, but a lady came through. And uh, through some interaction, I invited her to church. And her response was, I'm looking for somewhere to go. I'm looking. And I said, well, this is a great place to come. If you're looking, God will put people in your path for you to talk to, for you to invite the church. But you gotta be willing to do it. Stand with me if you will, please. Uh, I had a story written here. Fifth grade, grade Sunday school class was asked to go home and count the stars in the sky as part of their Sunday school lesson. One kid came home and he said, I counted a hundred stars. And another kid said, I counted a thousand stars. And the third kid said, I counted three stars. And the teacher said, three stars? 
And he said, yeah, I guess my backyard isn't as big as everybody else's. <laughs> Let me tell you, this whole world is our backyard. And there are souls that need us, that need what we have today. <sighs> Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we worship you, we praise you today. Lord, I pray that you will spark a desire in us to take what we have experienced this morning, to take your presence, to take your, 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 your will, your, your, your guidance, your call, your direction, and take it outside the walls of this church into our communities, Lord, into our neighborhoods, into, into everywhere we go, into our workplaces, our schools, our, our families. Lord, I pray that there will be a revival that sweeps through this community. Lord, that, that those that have walked away will come home. And that, Lord, those that didn't have an opportunity, that don't know you, Lord, I pray that we will be this bright light on the hill, Lord, this beacon that, that draws them to you. Lord, I pray that you will equip us to go into the harvest to preach and to teach and to heal and to make disciples. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Uh, I cut a lot out of this and I'll probably pick it back up in a few weeks, but I want you to know our best days are ahead of us. I believe that. God's got a call for this church and I am beyond excited about where we're going and the things that we're doing. All right, I got one real quick announcement and then Josh is going to sing and Daryl's going to pray our dismissal. All right. If you are 60 or older, 60 or older, I want to meet with you right after church, right up front here. King's Daughters. I heard my iPad ding, I thought it was my mom. Anyway, the King's Daughters is the 30th, not the 23rd. I told Josh wrong, I got that wrong, that's on me. It's the 30th, not the 23rd. Please announce correction. <laughs> I, I don't do subtle, you know that. Andre can hint for three months stuff she wants for her birthday. I'll miss her. She's got to like write it down, put it in front of my face. Oh, that's a great idea. I'll take care of that. All right. Uh, so if you're 60 or older, I want to meet with you right down front. Josh, sing us a, a song and then Daryl, this is in prayer.